Hi, welcome to New Hope Community Church Online. The sermon you are about to hear was originally given by Pastor Chuck Wilson. New Hope Community Church, to know, to live, and to share Jesus Christ. But the title for today is Happy Are the Sad. Wow, it'll make sense in a minute. Matthew 5, verse 4. And remember, we've been going, we started the Sermon on the Mount. We're actually in the book of Mark. But remember in Mark chapter 3, between chapter 3 and 4, we bounced over to Matthew 5 because that's where the Sermon on the Mount fit in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how it fit in there. So we, uh, we're kind of kind of doing a shotgun approach to this, but that's where it fit. And in the Sermon on the Mount, we're talking about the be attitudes, the attitudes that we need to be to have, right? And it's the secret to true happiness, are the, what we've kind of looked at as a theme of these be attitudes. And remember we talked about the happiness of the Bible, the happiness that Jesus taught is a very different from the world's happiness. The world's happiness is a, a good emotional response based on positive circumstances in our life. And that's kind of, that's the world's, that's the world's focus. But we're looking at a whole different way of how to get God's happiness and, and what it really means and how to get it. And Jesus gives nine keys, nine keys to to. God's happiness, and he builds on each one. And the first one we looked at last week was happy are the poor, the poor in the spirit. And that means we, we realize we totally need God. We're, we're totally helpless and, and hopeless without him. We need him for salvation in order to have, get a relationship with God. But we also need him to live this life daily, constantly need him. And that was the first thing. Now today's really goes, and each one builds on the other. We looked at the poor, and today we're going to look at the sad, right? And they kind of build on each other on, on how to be, have God's happiness. And today's really goes against the grain. It's totally counter culture this one totally counterculture because in the usa today our culture if you want to be happy what do you do whatever you want to do whatever makes me feel good that's what i i do and that's what we're taught to do right eat love and pray right that's why that's the secret to this happiness but not praying to god that you know if you if you know anything about this story, you know, the, the praying was to the, the yoga. Well, use yoga. You, you, most prayers is, is yoga, and, and yoga is Hinduism. That's the basis. That is what it is. It's equal, equal to Hinduism. And um, I was in India, and in India, they pray to 220 million gods. So take your pick. You could pray to the, the god of the monkeys. And I went to these temples. There's monkeys, people praying to them. Cows, we all know they pray to cows. Uh, rats, there's a temple with rats. I don't have time for all 220 million of them. But, but whatever you want, you know, you just pray to it. And whatever, whatever, just eat, love, and pray. Do the yoga, do the, you know, pray. And, and focus on whatever god you want. Do whatever makes you feel good. Do drugs. Do anything with anyone. Anytime you feel like it. And if anyone, like a spouse or anything, like a job or a church or anybody, isn't fulfilling you, then dump and ditch it. Right? Dump and ditch. That's, that's what you do. And that's kind of just our whole philosophy of our culture. And a lot of people are buying it, aren't they? Aren't we? <laughs> so Jesus gives a radical, radically different formula for happiness. And it won't make any sense apart from faith. So let's pray. Father, we pray that you would give us the faith, the faith to accept your word and understand your word and live your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us through your mercy and grace now. I pray that every one of us would know what true fulfillment is and and how to get it. Because it goes against the flesh, it goes against everything that we've been taught and everything that we think and feel And yet we know it's true. Give us the faith to accept your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Matthew 5, verse 4. Last week we did verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Today, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The, remember the word blessed means uh, it's happy, but it's not the shallow happiness. It's a lot more than that. It's not the, the shallow emotional response to positive circumstances in life. Remember we mentioned that? But it's a supernatural inner joy that is not touched by anything that happens outside. Outward circumstances have no effect on this supernatural 
inner joy that Jesus is talking about, that he wants us to have. And he says, happy are those who mourn. That's why I got the title. Happy are the sad, you know. That doesn't make any sense, but it will when we get later on when we talk about the comforting part. That's where the happiness comes from. But he's not talking about, now this is important, he's not talking about mourning because of the loss of, of someone, like the loss of a loved one, or loss of something, like our house or our job. Or, he's not talking about that mourning, although God does comfort us in those times, totally. He, God walks us through every step of grief, every stage of grief. He's there for us. There's many other verses. But that's not the mourning that Jesus is specifically talking about right here. He's talking about a different kind of mourning. He's talking about realizing that our relationship with God is broken by sin. Remember last week, poor, we realized we're helpless, we're hopeless, we're, we're a mess. And, and today, it, realizing that it's been broken by sin. Just like a human relationship. Think of any relationships. Family, spouse, friends, if you wrong somebody, you break the relationship, right? I mean, you don't lose the relationship, but, it, but something's been broken in that relationship. And it's the same thing with God. He's our Heavenly Father, and sin breaks that relationship. But not only that, he's not only our Father, but he's also the judge. He's the judge of the universe. He's the king of the universe. And when we break God's law, not only is he our Father, but he's also the judge. And in order to be a just God, and he is just, he has to punish breaking of the law, breaking of sin. It has to be done. If you ever watch Chronicles of Narnia, you know what I'm talking about, the whole the lion and how somebody had to pay that price because otherwise the king isn't just anymore if he doesn't punish it. So even though he loves us, he's our father who loves us, he still has to punish wrong. Be like if you went to a, a if you got a traffic ticket and you go to the justice of the peace, down in town here, and you're going to go before him to deal with your traffic ticket, and it turns out to be your dad. What would happen if you go before your dad, the justice of the peace, and you say, well, here's my ticket, dad. <laughs> He's like, no, I'm the justice of the peace today. Right? Would, could he let you off? Well, yeah, it happens all the time. You know, people bribe, you can see it all the time. But, but would he still be just? No, if he were to let us off for nothing, he would lose his justice. He would no longer be just, and God is just. He's holy, he's just, but he also loves us. He's our Father, that's why he sent Jesus Christ, to pay for the wrong we've done, to pay for our sin. Somebody had to pay for it, and only one person could do that. Someone who never broke the law, Jesus Christ, his Son. So, that our sin has broken our relationship, and we realize, when we mourn, we realize that our sin has separated us from this holy God, our Father, and we see its effects. We see the effect that it's broken our relationship with, with our Heavenly Father. It's broken, it's hurting us. All sin hurts us. God doesn't say, don't do this and that, because he wants to steal our fun. He knows it's going to hurt us. It's like a little kid in the, our kids in the road. They always want to go out and play in the road, you know. They, we have this big, you know, we got the yard and all that. Quiet. They always want to be in the road, you know. But, well, why do I tell them, don't go on the road? Road. They think I'm taking all their fun away. They want to go out, ride their bikes, play on the road. But really, it's gonna, they're going to get killed sooner or later on that road. And that's what sin is. God doesn't say don't do something because he wants to take away our fun. He knows it will hurt us because he created us to live a certain way. So that's, that's why he said, that's when God sees that we mourn because we realize that sin is hurting us. It's hurting us and it also hurts other people. Everything that we do hurts somebody else. Every sin that we commit has an effect on somebody else. The whole philosophy is, well, I'm not hurting anybody. As long as what I'm doing is not affecting anybody, it is affecting somebody. I can't think of anything that I can do wrong that won't affect somebody. And usually many people. And so, last week we saw how the first step is to see our spiritual poverty. That we're helpless and we're hopeless. And now Jesus says the next step is to mourn because of it. To mourn because of it. And see, this is the first step. If you've never become a Christian, or if you recently became one, we know the first step to becoming a Christian, the first step to true salvation, conversion, whatever you want to call it, is to mourn our sin. Mourning and repentance go hand in hand. Mourning and repentance. In the United States, there's this whole philosophy out there. I, it's been called easy believism. Just believe. Just believe in Jesus. Just believe and take that free gift. 
and you don't have to worry about your sin and you don't have to change. Just just believe. Just raise your hand on TV. Just believe, right? Chuck, we talk about this a lot. That easy believism. And it's a free gift. Now, yes, it is a free gift. Let's not get mixed up on this. It's totally free. You cannot earn salvation. For, for it's by grace you are saved. It's a gift of God. We all know that very, very clearly. But we must realize what the gift really is and why we need it. And that's because we realize that sin has separated us from God and its effect, be, the effect on us before we're moved to seek the cure. There's a, for those who have ever struggled with addictions know this, you have to hit rock bottom, right? You have to hit rock bottom because until you hit rock bottom, you keep trying on your own until you hit rock bottom. Then you say, I surrender, I give up, I need, I need God's help. Well, the same thing, spiritual, we need to hit spiritual rock bottom where we say, I know my sin has messed me up, separated me from God, destroying my life, destroying other people, it's destroying everything. We hit that spiritual rock bottom and that's where we, we have to go before we can receive that gift. We have to hit that before we receive the gift. And repentance, repentance means you're walking one way, you turn around and you're walking the other way. That's what the word literally means, to repent. Repentance always precedes true faith. Always. Remember the woman who came to Jesus and, and, and came to Jesus and she washed Jesus' feet with her hair and her tears. That was the woman who found forgiveness. In Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit first hit everybody between the eyes and, and, and started moving in a powerful way. And Peter was preaching his super sermon. And listen to what he says here. Peter says, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. Cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and believe. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Repent. That's the first step to true faith is repent and be baptized. We hit that place where we say, I realize my sin nailed Jesus to the cross. The Jews didn't kill Jesus. The Romans didn't kill Jesus. I killed Jesus. It's my sin. It was my rebellion. It's my hostility to his will. That's what made it necessary for God to send his son to die in my place, to take my punishment. And the tears and the grief prepare the heart to receive the gospel and to receive forgiveness. And when we take that first step and we come to Christ and we say, God, I repent of everything wrong I've ever done that is against your word and against your will, and against your plan for my life. And I put my faith in Jesus who died on the cross in my place, who took my punishment, paid for that ticket, so that I could come before you and receive forgiveness from my Father who's also just. When we take that step of faith, we're forgiven. We're going to talk about that in a minute. We're forgiven. It's washed away. We're back in a relationship with God our Father. We, we have found what the Bible calls salvation. Salvation. But it does, mourning doesn't stop at salvation. A lot of people say, well, I did all that. Mourning doesn't stop at salvation. It's not a one-time event. Mourning, Jesus, all these beatitudes are a way of life. Mourning is a way of life. Just as poverty of spirit, God, I need you, I need you, I need you. I'm totally dependent on you. I need your grace to just do anything. That's the first step. But mourning, just the continually mourning, is also a way of life. Not saying we have to go around being sad and cranky and crying and I'm not talking about that I'm not talking about the countenance we have the countenance of joy but it's an inner spirit of mourning we're mourning as we get closer to God we, we, we mourn we mourn the, the, our sin in our life we mourn the sin in the church and we mourn the sin in the world that's what we is a constant mourning that we have even though we have a joyful countenance we have a joy in our spirit but we still have that mourning because as we get closer to God we're going to become more sensitive to that sin aren't we 
As we get closer, that's what should always be happening. As we grow spiritually, get closer to Christ, we will become f- way more sensitive and, and, and aware of the sin in our own life and the church and the world. God will reveal so much. It's like peeling an onion, I always say. You know how when you peel an onion, you peel one layer off, and what do you have? Another layer. Peel that off. Another layer. Peel it off. It just keeps going. And as you peel, you cry because you got the onion, right? And that's what happens with the morning. God starts to peel that onion. And, and, and we find, what? This is down there? I thought that was gone. A whole new level of pride. A whole new, deeper lust that we thought was, we were done with. He reminds us of past sins that we, we committed, that we never repented of. We never tur- turned over to him. We never really w- wept over. And we're like, ouch, ow, I can't, oh, I can't believe. I forgot all about that. You know? And he just keeps peeling that onion so that, that the repentance goes deeper and deeper and the healing goes deeper and deeper. And we also are grieved not just about our own sins, but we're grieved over the sins in the church. Did I really just hear that person say that? You know, in my church, <laughs> did, did they really just say they saw that movie? They saw that movie. You know, and wait, you know, wait, hold on. I used to watch those same movies, and I used to laugh at the same stuff. I, and, you know, every once in a while, I'll turn on something, I'll see a movie. I thought, oh, this is really funny, guys. Come here, this is really funny. Start watching, like, <gasps> shut off the. I can't believe I saw that or laughed at that or thought that was entertaining. You know, because we become more sensitive, right? And now it breaks our heart. What if, what if Jesus came to the church in America today? How big a whip do you think he'd bring to America, the church in America? Think, think of the, you know, the whipping Jesus, you know. Uh, how big a whip would it, he didn't need, he'd need a bazooka, not a whip, right? Uh, what if he was sitting here right now? What if he rode home with you in the car? What if he had lunch and spent the rest of the day with you? He will. <laughs> he is here. He is with us all the time, right? It, 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 he is here. Our, he's grieved by that sin. Are we, grie- are we living like that? We realize he's really in our life. And we'll, not just personal sin, not just ch- sin in the church, but sin in, the, in our world, should, in our culture, in our country, in our world, should, will really start to grieve us as we're more serious, uh, more, as we grow more sensitive spiritually. It will happen in our life. Psalm 119.53, when David says, indignation grips me because of the wicked who have forsaken your law. Do we have that indignation? Now, notice he didn't say, not self-righteousness. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about spiritual indignation. That not just says, why are they doing that? But why am I allowing this? Why am I part of this too? It's, it's all of us, right? We had prayer for life. Um, there's so many churches. I, 50, 60 churches are part of this prayer for life. Down at the Planned Parenthood. Just outside praying. Just praying for, praying for these women. Praying for these babies. Praying that God would break our hearts as a country. And, and our day was last Wednesday. Elizabeth set it up. And we got a great message from one of the organizers. She went down at the end of the day. At the end of our prayer day. And she ran into a woman coming out of Planned Parenthood. And the woman came out. And they started up a conversation. And the long story short is. This woman said, I'm not going to have an abortion. I'm going to keep my baby. And they offered her all the help and the resources and all kinds of things. And it was just, this woman was so excited. And that was, that was the accumulation of a lot of prayers that day. If you prayed that day, you had a part in saving a baby. But with our country, though, as awesome as that is, it makes us think, though, have we really as a country killed over 50 million babies? Have we allowed that as a church without speaking the truth in love? Have we really be, been part of this? Yeah. And, and I, know, I know a lot of folks here have been part of abortion, you know, whether you or your girlfriend or, or spouse. I, I know a lot of people have been affected. People talk to me about it all the time. And, and I know it's a reality, and, and I know so many of you have found forgiveness. You've mourned it. You've repented. You've found the forgiveness. You've found the healing. you walk through the grief. Well, I want to encourage you, if, if you've never done that, I want to encourage you to confess it, to grieve, 
to get the healing. Uh, there's so many people here, counselor, they tell me all the time, if you know anybody, make sure you talk, have them talk to me. I'll take them through this, the healing. Make sure, don't, don't, we do need to grieve it, not ignore it, grieve it, confess it, and, and get the healing. But back to the United States, we need to mourn what's going on in our country. Not just abortion. You pick, check your box. It's unbelievable what we've done going against God's word as a country. We need, we need to mourn. It, we, the sin of our nation. Billy Graham, years ago, said, I'm trying to remember the quote exactly, he says, if God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. That was a long time ago. 30, 40 years ago, he said this. A lot of water has gone under the bridge since that time, hasn't it? Think about what it's like now. Ezekiel, and you want, just, just to give you a picture of, of and I know we, the whole Joel Rosenberg thing we did, Ezekiel 9 in Ezekiel 9, verse, I'll do the whole chapter actually. He's, he's talking about judging Jerusalem because of their sin and judging the nation because of their sin. And notice who gets spared in this whole thing. This is very important. Then I heard him call out in a loud voice, Ezekiel 9 1, bring the guards of the city here, each with a weapon in his hand. He's having a vision here. And I saw six men coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. With them was a man clothed in linen who had a writing kit in his side. They came and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of Israel went up from above the cherubim, where it had been, and moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had been writing had the writing kit at his side, and said to him, Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. As I listened, he said to the others, Follow him through the city and kill without showing pity or compassion. Slaughter old men, young men, maidens, women and children, but, not, but do not touch anyone who has the mark. And that's exactly what happened. If you read the rest of Ezekiel, that's exactly what happened to the nation of Israel and to Jerusalem. That God went through and he saved his remnant. Those who had the mark of God. Those who grieved and mourned over what was going on. Now let's fast forward several thousand years to Revelation chapter 9. In Revelation chapter 9, we know Jesus is coming again. And we know the day of the Lord is going to be a day of salvation for some and a day of judgment for others. And here's just one judgment in Revelation chapter 9, where it says, verse 1, The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the keys to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and skies were darkened by the smoke from the abyss, and out of the smoke locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Once again, the seal of God. And we know where we get that seal. Ephesians 4.30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we receive the seal. When we grieve and lament over the sin in our, our world, we, we, have this, we have this mark on our forehead that, that is very is key. Is key. As we come closer to the day of the Lord. Do we mourn what's going on? Do we mourn sin in our life? Do we mourn sin in the church? Do we mourn the sin in our world? And Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. It goes against everything in our country. We, you know, happy are those who laugh, right? You know, that's, that's who's happy, right? Uh, it goes against everything in our culture to be, to, to, or everything that we feel to be sad. But we end up being happy because God does not leave us in that sadness. He doesn't leave us in our mourning and our grief. He says, Jesus is blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Why? Because we've turned to God for forgiveness and healing. We're going to be comforted. And that's, that's powerful to know that we're going to be forgiven. If you've ever put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have been forgiven. Anything you've ever done or ever will do, you are totally forgiven. Completely at that point of putting your faith in Jesus Christ. And that is powerful. That's what a relationship with Jesus Christ offers. That is what something that no, this is something that we, as sharing our faith, that's something we can offer to people that no other religion offers that kind of forgiveness. Check them out. None of them do. 
No religion, no philosophy, no counseling, no psychiatry, nothing can offer forgiveness except for a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know something? I, I, I've been in ministry 30 years about now, and I'll tell you something. Almost all self-medicating that I see people do is because they need forgiveness for something. Almost every self-destructive behavior, all the hurt, all the counseling that people go to, all, every, everything that people do, the root, I really believe this, and I've talked to a lot of other counselors that tell me the same thing, the root is the need for forgiveness. That's what hurt and driving people, is the need to be forgiven. We all carry this incredible load of guilt, don't we? With this tremendous burden that can only be laid at the cross of Jesus Christ. I mean, if you've ever watched, uh, read Pilgrim's Progress or watched the DVD Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan, amazing book. Second only to the Bible, bestseller of all time, only to the Bible, Pilgrim's Progress. And it, it's just a powerful, when Pilgrim carrying this giant burden on his back comes to the cross and lays it down, you're just like, yes, finally. And that's what each one of us can do. No matter what we've done, no matter what we will do, it can all be forgiven by Jesus Christ. And not just that, as Christians, after we put our faith in Christ, we can still keep receiving the daily cleansing, the daily forgiveness. Whenever we flirt with the world, and whenever we indulge the the flesh, and whenever we sin, whenever we do that, we're miserable, right? Just, I I just, whenever I sin, you know... I don't. Not, I try not to. I try to fight sin, not because I want to get. Don't want to get caught. Not because uh, the consequences. Not because it says not to. You know why I do? Because I feel miserable. I feel far from God when I sin, and I hate that. I hate, hate that that separation from that closeness with God. That's why I'm miserable. You know why? Because Ephesians four thirty says. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. When we sin, the Holy Spirit is grieved. And when he's grieved, we're grieved. When my kids do something wrong, it upsets me. And when I get upset, I upset them. Different ways. Uh, So, that's what it does. But if we repent... We are restored to that relationship with God. 1 John 1, 9. If you've never memorized this, memorize it and live it. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's a daily experience. There's a one-time salvation, cleansing, forgiveness. That one time, that's about salvation. But the relationship, the daily relationship is what this is talking about. It's not, this is talking about the daily relationship. That's a daily thing. Just like you keep going to your spouse or friends or whoever, say, I'm sorry I did this wrong, I'm sorry that. It clears the air. The same thing spiritually. We have to keep on going to God. And when we do that, he's waiting to forgive us. Don't wait till you clean yourself up. Don't wait till you you're good for a day. Don't wait till you're good for a week. Go right to him and ask for his mercy and grace right away. I, the kids, I got a couple of them. And, uh, you know, when they do something wrong, you know, I got to deal with that. But it's, I, my only goal is to break that bad attitude that they have or, or to stop them from hurting themselves or hurting, or hurting their siblings or hurting somebody else. But as soon as they do that, as soon as they do that, I say, okay, I'll talk to you in a week now. Keep it up. Oh, we, right away, give them a big hug. You want to be restored? I want to be restored with them as much as they want to be restored, right? And that's what God is, God is like. He's just waiting to hug us. He wants to have us in a close relationship. That's why he gave his son Jesus to die for us. Because he loves us. He really loves us. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? That he loves us that much. Are you in a close relationship with him right now? Maybe you've been a Christian for 50 years. I don't know. But, but are we in a close relationship with him? Are we, living in, are we living in the peace and joy that is our right? Is the right of our relationship with our Heavenly Father? Do we have that? Or have we been chasing the world's happiness? And as a result, we're miserable. We were at the soccer game last night. Uh, the township has the soccer under the lights. All the little kids go down to the fields. 
And we were there and they just, they put as many kids on the field as they can and they throw a ball out there and they're under the lights and it's, it's just crazy. It's crazy. It's not good soccer, but it's a lot of fun. And, and Andrew and I were talking afterward and Andrew's like, uh, and why do we do this? Because it's just a mob, you know, of kids. It's not good soccer. He goes, why do this? I go, you know why? It's because, it's because of the cider and the donuts and the apples. And look at all the little kids running around. It's really not about the soccer. It's about all that stuff. And so many times, that's what we're like as Christians. The world is, is chasing the herd, the mob, is chasing this ball. You've got to chase this ball to be happy. And they're all chasing it around. And we get pulled into this this mob chasing it and we're not happy you know who's having fun so people doing the opposite they're on the sidelines having their cider and donuts and running around in the woods and and having fun and 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 that's what the christian faith is like we we don't have to follow the world's ball and get into the mob god has a whole different way that's pointless and we miss out on what god really wants for us and maybe to have that happiness maybe to have that we there's something we need to confess Something we need to mourn, something we need to confess, something that we need to get out of the way this morning so that we can go back to God and get that hug that he wants to give us. Maybe you're saying you don't have that relationship with God. You've never put your faith in Jesus Christ. I want to have a question for you. Are you sick and tired of trying to find happiness, fulfillment apart from God's love? Are you, are you tired of it? We all get there, don't we? I, I'm, I, I'm so sad when I see this culture, this whole generation, the new generation coming up even more, but it's everybody, it's young and old, that, have, that are so lost. I see it in the young people. So lost because they bought a lie. You want to be happy? This is the lie they bought. You want to be happy? Then, then buy this. Then drink this. Smoke this. Snort this. Have sex with this person. Do whatever makes you feel feel good and that's all this this whole generation does whatever makes them feel good and you know what the result is it's the most miserable group of people i've ever seen have you ever seen a more miserable generation just check how many are taking meds i'm not against meds i know some of us need meds it's okay I, you know i i think i take five or six meds myself yeah but my my, my point though is it, there, there, there's no such thing as a happy pill there's no such thing as a pill that's going to heal the wounds that are created by following the world's formula. Miserable. Never seen a more miserable, lost generation, probably in this country ever. And it's not just the young people, it's everybody. You know why? Because everybody's living for themselves. And it's empty because that will never make us happy. We are not created to live for ourselves we are created to live in a relationship with god and to live for other people and we don't find happiness by grabbing at it you trip over it by following god and and helping other people you trip over happiness it's an accident you can only find fulfillment True happiness in a relationship with God our Father. Has, sin has blocked that. But God has made a way through Jesus Christ. And if we repent, and if we mourn our life, and if we put our faith in it, we can have forgiveness and have a brand new life. John 3.16. I'll leave you to this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Let's pray. As we go to this time of prayer, I want to encourage you to, to have a talk with God. Maybe you're here today and you've never repented and put your faith in Jesus Christ. You've been living that empty life that... <laughs> We've all lived, every one of us, apart from Jesus Christ. But you've hit a spiritual rock bottom. And today the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And you're, you feel the Spirit pulling you into a relationship with God. Would you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Right now. Right where you're sitting. 
You may have come in miserable, but you don't have to leave with that burden on your shoulders. You can leave it at the cross of Jesus Christ right now. Just say, God, I believe Jesus, your son, died on the cross for me. I'm asking for forgiveness. I'm begging for forgiveness. I want a brand new life in Jesus Christ. I repent of my sin and my old life. And I want to follow Jesus. Forgive me. Make me a new person. If if you've put your faith in Jesus this morning, then whatever you carried in, you will not carry out. It's been forgiven. And nothing can change that. Not your feelings, not Satan's accusations, not consequences for past actions. Nothing can change the fact that you are forgiven and your faith is in Jesus Christ. You now have God as your loving Heavenly Father. I want to encourage you to let somebody know. Maybe you came with someone. Let me know. Fill out the card. Shoot me an email. Tell me on the way out. Something. So we can encourage you, be excited for you, and encourage you in your new life. Help you with this new life. For those of us who are already Christians, what is the Holy Spirit convicting of us, convicting us of this morning? Do we have the joy and the peace that is our right because of our relationship with God, our Father, and His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ? There's nothing worse than being a miserable Christian. Because <laughs> it's unnecessary, and yet some of it, so many of us, myself included, we live too much of our life miserable, forfeiting the peace. What do we need to confess to God this morning? God's waiting. He's waiting to give us a big hug. He's waiting to take us back into his arms. He wants to be close with us. Just repent. Just tell him you're sorry. Maybe something's really strong in your life, and we need to say, God, show me who to talk to. Who can help me with this? Because it's too strong for me. I need, I need someone to come alongside of me. A friend, someone to encourage me in this struggle I'm going through. This temptation, this sin, this depression, this loneliness, this addiction, this whatever I have in my life. Father, I know we all struggle. We all need your grace. We all need your mercy. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit would really move in a powerful way in our hearts today, this week. Let us experience an amazing new intimacy with you. An incredible joy that we've never experienced before. It may just flow out of us touching other people's lives as they see Christ in us. I pray that, Father, for our church, that we would not settle for the world's happiness or the world's formula or the world's shallow fun, but we would know the deep, deep joy and peace and fulfillment that is ours in Christ. Pray that for every person here in Jesus' name. Amen.